Okay. Well, welcome back everyone after you've completed your first assignments. Um, it's good to see everyone submitted. Uh, even people wasn't, I weren't too sure were active in the course. Um, all submitted, so it's good to know that you're watching along on these videos and participating. And this week we're going ahead and we're looking at policy documentation and in particular around the process of creating a vision document for your um, implementation plan that you'll be doing for your second assignment and discussing that in some more detail. So before we get started on that, has anyone got any questions about the first assignment or anything related to that? It'll take a couple of weeks before I mark that and get that back to you. Um, but that should happen fairly soon. That was my question. How long? <laughs> That's usually like until we find out how, how well, good we did. Yes, well, technically it's up to three weeks, but I normally get it done in about a week and a half or two weeks um, and get you those results back. Of course, you can then use some of that to assist you in your second assignment or at least give you some guidance as to the level of work and commitment you need to put into the second assignment um, based upon feedback from the first assignment. Uh, but it does take me a little bit of time to get that done. Yeah, I, I think it, it, the feedback will be good for me <laughs> because actually after the last class of discussion, I went back to reassess which model would be better. So I read more in depth about both models and mm -hmm. the FAMR model could be actually a good choice, but I'm still debating. I'm going to see when I start with the implementation plan, which one will suit better the needs and the context. So. Okay. But at least, I, mean, I, I think that the exercise of the first assignment is good because it actually gives you an idea of how you can make it work. And with the scenarios, you can play along trying to think how it, you actually can make it successful. So choosing the right model will be really important. It does certainly help. And, and the techniques and approaches that we used in the first assignment, and indeed the entire first assignment, is designed to assist you um, in progressing to your implementation plan. But let's get into this evening and start looking at the three readings that I've provided you. Um, I live in hope that you've got a whole list of questions to ask about those readings and we can bounce those questions backwards and forwards. So does anyone have any questions about the readings? No, the one about uh... I'm looking at the one about UNESCO and how to understand policy. Mm -hmm. The uh, what is it? Not the last one. So that's the third reading, uh, the policy, UNESCO. Yeah, handbook. the policy yep. analysis. I don't know if we sh if we're gonna start there or we're gonna start with the other ones, but the one on policy is basically it's basically telling us that we should interrogate policies back home. So we can actually work better our implementation plan because there's a lot, you know, at the end of every section, there's a lot of questions that you should be asking when you are working on policy. So is this kind of question we should be asking policy back home? Um, well, there's two aspects of things this evening. The first bit around is around setting our own policy um, and we're framing that around vision statements in particular um, and setting that to help direct our own policy development, which is what your implementation plan essentially is. It's a policy statement for your organization. But then also contextualizing that within larger policy documentation, which often either constrains or assists um, our own particular endeavors. And understanding the policy framework of any environment, be it a national environment, um, such as the UNESCO framework support, or within an individual school or even a classroom, you'll have certain policies that are in place that are set up to make things work effectively and efficiently in that organization. So it may be some classroom rules for your classroom. Um, when students are encouraged to speak and when they're discouraged to speak, 
when they can move around and do things independently, when they have to follow instructions. There'll be certain policies established. Uh, and there may even be goals as part of that, where you've got um, classroom goals uh, towards having a harmonious learning environment for everyone, ensuring everyone has an opportunity to learn and things of that nature. But we can take policy development all the way up to the international stage, which is what the, the UNESCO document does. And it starts looking at how policy can help shape national educational agendas um, and help support that or in some cases hinder it, but they're designed primarily to support um, developments, particularly around education. Now, I just asked us, do you need to read the whole handbook? Uh, let me just check what I said on the web page. Um, yes, in terms of reading it, the idea of large documents is for you to skim read them um, focus in on the uh, table of contents and what are the main issues being presented in the document and generally focus in on those those sections that are most contextually important for us and in this case for the this document it's primarily section one where they discuss what educational policy is um, and that's what we're sort of looking at the context for the UNESCO framework is not so important for our particular discussion, um, but the sections where they explain the different strategies and contexts and priorities for different educational organizations could, can certainly be useful. And it breaks it then up into different levels, be it early childhood, primary, secondary, tertiary, technical. And for your particular area, you should focus in on and read that particular section in more detail. Uh, but then also look at some of the, the themes that they identify. Now, for most of us, AIDS and HIV may, be, may not be major educational themes for our organizations. But for some countries, they're very important. Um, gender may or may not be a major issue in your educational organizations, but for some countries, it's a very significant issue in their um, educational policies. Um, and the same for sustainable development and so forth. ICT, though, one of the very last sections, you should also have a look at, though, page 71. So there are certain sections that are more important than others, but you should have a skim read of the whole thing and then just focus in on a few particular areas that are of particular interest to yourself. I understand it's relatively long, but it is broken up into um, major sections and key points. So those sort of documents shouldn't take that long for you to just browse through. Yes, so this the early childhood section would be obviously an area that you would want to have a particular interest in and focus in on what the policy development framework is for that context. Okay, well, let's start maybe, let's hop, okay, let's start with the UNESCO document then. Normally, I start with the other ones, but we may as well start with the UNESCO one now that we're already here. I'll just bring it up and share it and then hear from your questions again. So the first section goes through the idea of what educational policy means and how we can use policy to help shape our strategies and our plans. So in your case, you're going to be developing up a plan, um, an implementation plan, but that'll involve some strategy and it will also sit within the framework of various policies that your government may set, that your educational hierarchy may establish, or if you're working in a school, you're school leadership may set various policies and you need to work within those particular structures. So anyone got any comments or statements around the idea of policy and how it relates to um, organizational strategies and organizational plans?
Uh, I don't know if it's, um, for, for me it's not relevant, but it may help authors. What if you cannot find something specifically in policy to support anything that you are trying to implement? Let's say you go back and start looking, and you say, there's nothing that say, actually, I should be using uh, ICT in early education, early childhood education. How, how do you do that? How you can work that out? Okay, generally there will be policies established for almost any organizational structure. Um, they may not be called policies, they might be called rules or um, general documents you might have, like curriculum documents. Um, but there should be some framework that you need to work within that have been established by others. Uh, and they represent the policies for how your organization needs to work. Um, education, by its nature, has a lot of uh, policy influences where lots of different organizations, such as governments and um, even parent groups and industry groups, will try to shape what occurs in education by trying to establish various policy structures. Uh, so what sort of things do you think might be problematic in that you don't have within your framework, um, Henry? Probably if you're focusing like in equity issues, not sometimes when you read policy, they talk about equity issues, but they never say specifically what group or what minority or what underprivileged group maybe benefited from this particular strategy or plan we have in mind. So sometimes backing it up with policy requires like actually going back to more general views of the policy. In this case, you can join, you can go back and check on, let's say, the constitution of the country, like the UNESCO document says. Yes, but and in, in, in that case, those things frame a national policy, uh, which may not be even referred to as an educational policy, but it might be a national um gender policy or a national um, anti-discrimination policy. So it may not be specifically an education policy that may be of direct influence, although in education we tend to have our own specific policies that we work within, but there may be some national policies that do override or um, strongly direct educational policy, even if what would generally happen then, though, is there'll be an education policy developed around those particular issues. So for at the moment in Australia, there's a big debate around um, sex education and what should be taught in schools with regard to gender um, identity formation. Uh, and there's been certain national policies that have occurred around um, marriage equality, and that has now had some influence on school education in terms of recognition of a whole range of genders, um, in terms of equality for marriage, um, which is then impacting upon some people's conceptualization of what should be taught in schools. So at the moment, there hasn't necessarily been education policy that has been written to fit within that new, that changed national framework, but fairly quickly, there will be educational policies developed that are specific to education that address those national issues. Um, but yeah, sometimes things can change relatively quickly and then there needs to be aspects changed. Um, so in Australia, there would have been a big change in the 60s when our indigenous um, cultures were recognized and that would then have caused a major policy change in education to cope with all of those um, changes in our national policy framework. But generally, you should be able to find some specific educational policies that encompass most um, aspects of the culture of the society that your educational institution is framed within. So we can actually use white papers and gray literature for this case or not? You can, as long as they relate to the implementation plan that you're discussing. So if there are particular issues that you're looking to address um, at a national level, say something around the economics or other aspects, then you may be able to draw upon um, policy statements and documents that have been developed nationally 
where people haven't developed them into an educational perspective yet, but you can incorporate some of those things into your um, plan. So I was working on one today where in Queensland we've just developed a, a, a drone policy for the use of drones in education, or for use of drones to support the industri industry development of drones. And while it mentions a little bit about education, there hasn't necessarily been an educational policy framework developed for the teaching of drones and the use of drones in education. So that's an area where policy development at a state level is somewhat ahead of um, policy development within schools and within educational organizations. Um, but over time, those policies will be developed and schools will be required to work within the frameworks of how drones are seen as useful in education and when they can be appropriately used and when they can't and things of that nature. So, but yes, Henry, if you can find areas where you wish to explore policy and relate that um, and that fits outside of the educational context, then you can certainly incorporate that in. Um, but there's always lots of bureaucratic educators that like to develop policy um, and they're always looking for new changes and ways of um, in incorporating those things into policy statements that hopefully educators will read at some stage. Um, and certainly principals are meant to sort of read those sort of documents and then distill them into what can be appropriate for use in their schools um, and their teachers. And you can certainly incorporate many of those concepts into your implementation plans, particularly where they support the implementation plan. But there may be times when you have to oppose a particular policy and work out ways of trying to either have that policy changed or adjusted to allow your particular approach and your implementation plan to occur. So there might be a policy, for example, banning the use of mobile devices in schools. Um, that doesn't exist in Australia, but there are some countries like France at the moment where that does exist. So a teacher wanting or a principal wanting to implement an implementation plan around the use of ICT that involved the use of mobile devices would have to frame that within a national policy framework that didn't necessarily support the use of those technologies. Um, generally, most policy documents provide a way of doing that, but sometimes it is difficult. And there are some policy statements where um, educators might like to do things a certain way, but they simply can't. Um, a case in point is in some US states where the, the state policy is against the teaching of evolution in schools. Um, there's lots of science teachers that would dearly love to teach evolution as a scientific framework and theory, but they're restricted by particular policy um, approaches that are implemented in their states, um, and they have quite a lot of difficulties in those circumstances. Um, okay, anyone else got any questions about that first framing of what policy documents are and how they relate to developing strategies and plans? So maybe in our case, because uh, my um, organization, it's early childhood, you know, kindergarten. So maybe a policy, it's not related in my situation. So I don't need to talk about it. Or maybe I should just mentioning that uh, everything is based on principal decision because um, there is actually um, Mm, you know, iPads, computer, and digital devices are available in that kindergartens, but they are not using as a, you know, educating a student's material. It's something like, mm, you know, just like an old version of them. It's yep. just available for like showing a, just a cartoon or something like that, but they have like a capacity to teach better. Uh, however, nobody gonna check us. So I should say that nobody gonna check us or I should just don't mention it. You know what I mean? No, because you, you will have certain policies, even if they're unwritten policies, that relate to your particular classroom. So it may be that you might have a policy around when to update your equipment. And the policy might be not to update it, um, that you'll keep using it until it breaks. That's still a policy that you've established even though it may be unwritten and 
But as long as everyone understands that, that you can't afford to buy new equipment, so you just keep using it until it no longer works, and then you try to find some other way of doing things. Um, or you may have a policy around allowing the equipment to be used at certain year levels or at certain times or sharing the equipment. There can be a whole range of policies that you've established, even within a classroom or a group of teachers. You're um, talking about the kindergarten policy or no, the overall policy from government? No, for, for, for kindergarten, or it may be just your class policy, the rules <laughs> that you establish for your classroom. So policies can go all the way up to government, but they can also come all the way down to the decisions made around what you do in your classroom. Um, and in terms of the approaches that you take. Um, so a policy might be around when students, how much noise you allow in the classroom. And as long as you understand that and have established that and the students understand that, then that's become a policy. Um, we could call it a rule, we could call it various other things, but you've established it as, <coughs> as, as something that needs to be adhered to. So my idea for future was like um, implementing uh, Australian rules in my own uh, country's kindergarten. So in this case, I need to go and check what policies are actually out there about the kin uh, Australian kindergarten and then apply based on that uh, in my situation, right? Yes, that would be a good approach. So um, there's no requirement to, for you to do a comparative approach. Um, you certainly can if you wish. Uh, and take what you've found about Australian approaches and apply that um, in your context. Um, the main focus is applying it in your context. And while you can reference and refer to the Australian approaches, you don't need to go through a whole comparative um, aspect. You can mm -hmm. just use that as resources to support the development of your approach that you're going to apply. Because I found it out in uh, Iranian curriculum, there is a um, section. It said that uh, all the you know uh, schools are um, allowed to implement all the digital tools and application and everything. Uh, in this case, if it's like improvement for teachers' uh, activity in the class or uh, learning situation. So it's uh, like something based on our government rules. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure yet uh, um, which curriculum are like available and which policies uh, kindergarten use uh, for implementing their rules. You know what I mean? I need to go and ask them about what are you going to check? Where, where should I like looking for about the rules? Because I have no idea. And the only thing that I know it's um, kindergarten's policy is based on whatever a pr principal wants to do. And uh, um, something is based on what parents need. Uh, and uh, the parents' needs are based on whatever uh, children need to be prepared before school. They prefer to like going to the uh, kindergarten that actually and the curriculum and pedagogy available and make them ready for the you know primary school mm -hmm. and and based on that they are going making rules they said that okay our uh, kindergarten students are 90 percent uh, accepted to this primary school because this primary school have a, like um, strict rules and something like that and uh, uh, it's like an av advertisement for that uh, for parents no, so it's a little bit complicated, but sometimes it's actually good because I can do whatever I want. You know what I mean? There's nothing I should follow. You can, but in some respects that can be a little bit um, daunting as well. Because if, you, if there's no established policies, then if you do something and people complain, you've got nothing really to support why you did an approach other than um, you decided to do that approach. So policies can give you a framework that can assist you in doing innovative changes because it, you're saying that you're fitting within the policies, you're adhering to that, so you should be allowed and permitted to do the changes that you want to do. Um, if there's no guidance about what can and can't be done, then anyone can turn around and say you can't do that. Um, yeah, just, I agree. Yeah. So it's good to have some policies, even if they're unwritten policies, and part of your documentation part of your implementation plan may be to 
just describe the policy framework that you've established. Um, and then anyone that complains can say, you can say, well, this was what we decided. We wrote this down, we established this, and then we worked from this to develop our strategies and plans of what we want to achieve. Um, and if you've got problems with that, then you should have said so when we um, set all this in, into place rather than complaining about it later. So there's, it just helps you if things are established that um, gives you some framework in which to argue um, why you've gone ahead with certain approaches. Mm, you're right, because I had an argument with my uh, professor in leadership class that um, we need to spend a lot of time as a teacher uh, to make a like communication with parents and make them to like us. Because if they compliment and if they like, um, if they don't like us, they can easily sue us because there's no uh, rules to follow. And uh, there's sometimes parents are like, um, how can I say that? They need to be happy and they have different ideas about whatever happening in the classroom. And sometimes we like, uh, what should we do now? We should follow the, whatever they want or whatever it's uh, a student's benefits. And so um, the ICT tools actually, it's a way that we are like communicating with parents and make them happy and said that like, the yeah. no rules actually, it's like, like irritating us. Yes, no, I understand that. And, and there's two approaches to that. One is to establish a policy framework, which is normally provided from above. Um, and then you can say, we're working within this framework. Parents, um, if you want to complain about that, then you need to get the policy changed. Uh, the other approach is to bring them on board in the implementation plan development, which is the next step that we will be sort of going through uh, and getting them on board as stakeholders, as legitimate, having a, having a legitimate say in what the decisions are that is going to occur and having them be involved that way. And then if they argue against that, where well, you can say, well, you've had the opportunity to be involved and to shape what we're doing. You agree to all these different aspects um, and get them being supportive of the approach. But generally in most circumstances, particularly where there's the, the risk of being uh, litigious or being sued, there's some sort of framework about what the accepted norms are or, um, what parents should be able to expect from a kindergarten organization. And if there's not, then there probably does need to be policy development occurring so that everyone knows what the rules are in terms of what the parents can expect and what teachers can expect that they should be achieving um, in that sort of environment. But yeah, so I do feel for you if there's no such rules established, but generally those things are established because of the reasons you've said so that people don't get misinterpretations about what the expectations are and then get upset when those when their expectations aren't being met, um, either from the teacher side or school side and also the parents side. And there's some talk about actually trying to impose some rules on parents. Um, there are some schools that fine parents if they don't come and pick up their children on time um, and a whole lot of other things which are imposing expectations back on parents, such as an expectation on how much reading they should be doing with their children each night um, and a whole lot of other things that they should be agreeing to um, as part of the educational process. Um, hasn't been an awful lot of success with that. Some schools have been successful with the fining aspect, but um, getting parents to agree to being responsible for some of the academic development of their children and particularly some of the behavioral and moral development of their children is an area that we'd like to see progress in education, but has a few challenges because no one really is supporting educators in that approach. Uh, politicians and policymakers at a higher level don't really want to um, annoy parents because they vote for things and um, are in, have influence in that respect. But it is being more and more recognized that parents have a responsibility in education that has always been there, but they haven't been necessarily um, living up to that responsibility in recent years, particularly in the West. Um, certain other cultures, it's very strong where parental involvement is uh, is there and supporting students' development. 
but in Western societies it's certainly been lacking over the last decade or two. <coughs> now Adrian mentions that consistency in following your own policies is very important and that breaking your own rules can be uh, problematic. And yes, that is always a challenge. Uh, and that's where ideally, well, most policies are set above, from above. Um, we have our own policies in our own classrooms that we set for our students. So we're setting it above for them. And the implementation plans that we develop should be done in a more consultative way, where we get everyone on board in terms of how that plan may be. Now, there may be some policy development required as part of an implementation plan, but in the main, we work within existing policy frameworks um, and use those to support the implementation that we'd like to see occur with regard to innovation in our educational organisations. So any comments on that before we move on? Okay, let's go back to our document. Okay, so the document goes through explaining what a policy is. So it should be built on evidence, politically feasible, financially realistic, and agreed to by the government as the policy setter in most cases, and the relevant stakeholders. And UNESCO develops lots and lots of policies. Essentially, they're designed to assist developing countries um, where they have may not necessarily have the bureaucratic infrastructure to develop their own policies. And this is the general cycle for policy development. There's some sort of analysis of the learning environment and the school systems and all the rest. Some planning goes around that. They implement the policies see how they work and evaluate that and then start back again. Um, I'm involved in quite a lot of policy development around the use of uh, computing to teach computer science in schools at a UNESCO level and we use a similar sort of framework. Every two years we get together and we rewrite the policies and see if there's been any major changes that are needed um, to address in that policy framework. But the first step is setting a vision. And we're going to do that for your, for your implementation plans as well. So you need to know where you're going before you can actually make a plan on how to get there. Um, so establishing what you want to achieve is that first step. Then in policy development terms, um, analyzing the environment, and there we could use systems thinking to analyze particular environment. Then we come up, up with a plan. And in our case, it's gonna be an implementation plan. Then you implement that plan and evaluate it. And then the whole process starts again to hopefully have a continuous improvement cycle. So that's the general framework for policy development. Um, different groups there, we don't need to worry about all that. Different factors, geography and demography. Um, these are at a national level, all the different uh, systems that are involved in educational policy, the economy, the society, and the culture, the politics. And they all form stakeholders that we need to address and have involved in national policy development. But in your context, the policy development might be at a school level or even a classroom level. So you don't necessarily have to work at a national level unless you wish to, and that's sort of the context for your particular implementation plan. But if you're not working at that level, then look at the policies for your own educational organization. It might be a departmental policy, it might be a school policy, or even down to an individual classroom policy. And there's various approaches there. We don't need to worry about donors and all that sort of stuff. Understanding educational systems goes on from what we have done around systems thinking and gives a framework for looking at educational systems, um, breaking them down into various sectors. We've got um, early childhood, primary schools, secondary schools, uh, 
technical education, tertiary education, etc. And various approaches and um, dimensions for looking at all of that. And then particular themes. In particular, our theme is around ICT and also teachers and education. And uh, they've got a nice little three-dimensional framework there that you can sort of see the intersections, etc., etc. Um, so there's lots of different issues that you may find useful in your own context that you can incorporate into your implementation plans. Um, and some of these aspects we'll be incorporating into your implementation plan as well. Um, but we'll, we'll use a different framework to that. Uh, don't worry about that one. Okay. Uh, last little bit we want to look at were the different um, organizational groups. Uh, where are they? So here we are around early childhood education. Uh, where's that start here? So you can look at some of the um, aspects that are related to early childhood ed education and the key issues that are facing early childhood education at a national level and a global um, aspect here, particularly in developing countries, which is UNESCO's particular uh, remit in terms of exploring how to support uh, this sort of policy development in developing countries. And so some issues that you could look at and some resources in terms of international and national um, policy statements around goals for early childhood ed education here in the Asia Pacific region, um, etc. And you can look up those references at the end of the document. Then there's primary education, which is a little bit different. Some of the major issues there and a few of the reports. Then you've got secondary education. More of a focus on curriculum and leading into tertiary education. And some of the issues again around equity, quality of education and how to finance it all. And also aspects of, of cross-border higher education. So various issues that you can then explore and have a look at that relate to your particular context. Questions? Okay, so Adrian mentions uh, we have to use these, this step or are we free to pick something else we come across? Uh, no, there's going to be some other frameworks that I'll be showing you uh, that you can use. You can use elements from any framework, though, to help structure. Uh, your assignment has a fairly structured uh, approach as well, uh, but you can draw in ideas. Most of the systems use a similar process, so all of this policy development and implementation plan development has is relatively similar with different frameworks but you can incorporate different ones if you wish certainly when we come to visioning you can find hundreds of different frameworks on how to create organizational visions um, most business books have got some sort of visioning process there's lots of different uh, ways of going about that i'll just be showing you a couple tonight Okay, so any other questions from the UNESCO document around policy and policy frameworks at a large scale? Don't get too, too caught up with policy development. That's not really the intent of your second assignment. Um, but we do need to consider policies as part of our um, systems thinking approach because the policies set by others can influence what we can do and can't do in our particular circumstances. Uh, because they represent other systems outside of the system that we're looking at, but that do have an impact upon our systems. Yes, how these... Well, we're not so much worried about policy development per se. Um, we're more looking at how policy can impact upon our own implementation plan development. Um, um, other than setting a vision, you're not being asked to develop policy, uh, although you can develop a little bit if you wish. Um, the main focus of your second assignment is around developing an implementation plan. Uh, 
If there is a policy vacuum and you need a policy statement in order to do your implementation plan, then you could stray into the area of policy development and set a policy that needs to be adhered to for your organization. But our main focus is at that other end of the continuum that we looked at at the very beginning, where we have policy, strategy, and then implementation. We're focusing on implementation. And the assumption is that in most educational circumstances, there already exists a policy framework that we have to work within in order to achieve our implementation plan. Good. Okay then, well let's have a look then back at our very first document, which was the visioning process for designing responsive schools. So you will need to come up with a vision statement. Now there's quite a bit of controversy over vision statements. Some people say that they're completely useless, um, and no one ever looks at them. You spend a lot of time developing them, and then they're put on a shelf somewhere, and a few years go by, and then everyone says, we need a vision statement, and we say, oh, we had one. And you go and find the old one, and then you say, that's no longer particularly good, let's make a new one. Um, and yes, sometimes you use them for audits and things like that. But the important part of a vision statement is not necessarily following it, it's developing it. And getting everyone to agree to a particular vision for an organization, or having one even yourself before you develop your implementation plan. So while generally no one goes back and refers to them later, they are still an important part of a process of developing an implementation plan. Of course, if you don't really understand and come to an agreement on where you want to be in the future, it's difficult to set in place a map and get everyone to come on board with um, heading in that direction to that future. Has anyone been involved in developing vision statements before? I've been involved in about a dozen with uh, about half a dozen different organizations and they're an interesting process of people arguing what the, the real values are of an organization and what the real purpose is um, and different people have got different perspectives and that's quite an interesting process in itself in acknowledging different stakeholders and people's um, the factors that they consider them important or not important and stating that in a concise way about what the vision for an organization is. And yes, Adrian, you can do personal vision statements and set personal goals and things of that nature. And that's quite similar to an organizational vision statement. Often though, you don't necessarily go through the process of setting what you value, although that can be done on a personal level as well. It's normally left out. But certainly in an, in an organizational level, um, identifying what the, the core values are of an organization and then working out from that what the purpose is and the, where the organization would like to be in the future if it isn't at that, um, hasn't achieved all the things that the core goals um, say it should. So, for example, the School of Education, which is what you're doing this course within, has set a vision statement for this particular school. Um, the university has its own vision statement. Now, Griffith University has got some particular um, aspects of vision statements. All universities and all educational organizations generally have statements around um, having good educational outcomes for the students and all those sort of things. Griffith has a particular focus on equity and environmental issues and sustainability. And so they're strongly built into the vision statements where some other organizations might have a different focus on other things, such as maybe entrepreneurship and um, international research reputations and, and things of that nature. So while Griffith still has those to a certain extent, it has other emphasis as well. And so most educational organizations will have some very similar core values and vision statements. There can always be particular nuances that are relevant to um, the different circumstances. So for example, in schools, one particular school may have a really strong vision about having all the students engaged with technology. While for another school, that may not be a core value and, and principle at all. Um, they might have other things that they're really focused in. 
might be have a focus on sport and sporting excellence might be a particular vision for a school. So you'll need to think through what sort of vision statement you have for your educational organization and some of the outcomes you'd like to see as part of that. So let's get into the documentation and see what we're talking about. So, this is a design process for this. Oops, who's that? Welcome, Connie. So, in this process, it's a method of going through and getting everyone on board with establishing a vision for an organization. So, the first bit is that it needs to be consultative. Um, there are approaches whereby you can establish vision statements by um, the leadership or even the leader. But in the main, most modern approaches encourage a consultative approach to vision statements um, and taking on board the views of everyone involved in the organization. And that's certainly the approach that's being advocated for in this course. So jump in with anything that you've read about and want to discuss, you will have to speak up and not just type it in because I can't see what you've typed when I'm uh, presenting these documents. So a few little things, having parents views, uh, getting the wider input from the community, having ownership by those stakeholders in the vision statement. It's one of the worst things is having a vision statement imposed where it doesn't necessarily fit with what you agree with. And it should lead to some sort of change. It could be behavioral change. It could be academic performance change, a whole range of things. But the participatory process is an important aspect of um, vision development. And it all fits in with the framework of uh, strategic planning and goal setting. So here, setting goals is an important aspect of the process. And we'll get to that in a section. Uh, where are we? So, a few of the key things. The what, why, and how. The what is what needs to occur in the organization. Who's going to be responsible for that occurring. And the time frame for when it's going to occur. Why is... Um, the reasons for the implementation and it can also be delegated down to individual responsibilities in the organization and sometimes the why can simply be because you're the person in that role uh, the principal has to do these things because they're the principal the teacher has to do these things because they're the teacher and the how defines what has to be what has to occur and um, can also be involved in gaining everyone's agreement to make those things occur. Okay. There is a distinction between visioning and long-term planning. Visioning really sits outside of the planning process, um, but it certainly informs the planning process. Uh, where's the structure down here? Here we are. Um, there can be a range of different strategies that are used to achieve the vision. And here they use this, what's called a snow card technique. Um, basically what happens is you get all, your, all the people, all the stakeholders involved, and you start giving them particular problems to solve. Um, and those problems are related to establishing a vision for the organization. So it may be one problem might be around having high academic standards or getting students into university or having few behavioral issues or um, parents being happy with the educational outcomes. It could be a whole lot of different things that you can frame that around. And it just keep, gets people talking and discussing what the issues are that are important for that particular organization. And so that's what this document ends up with as a process for setting a vision. This is one I like a little bit better because it sort of frames 
vision development a little bit easier. Starts off a nice little quote about why we do things, where one person can see and be caught up with the here and now of the teaching process. Another person can be looking at the long term or the, the medium term sort of focus around uh, students progressing to the next year level and um, going on and pursuing their educational goals. But a third person can be seeing the really big picture and seeing how students might be contributing to the national well-being and the fact that we're going to have a better society as a result of the teaching process that they're involved in. And it all, to greet, all has to do with the perspective that we bring to a particular environment and problem. So defining a vision is the first step. And it should include the mission of the organization. So what the actual organization has been established to achieve. So if it's a school, generally it's been established to teach students. Um, other organizations can be established for other things. At, at a higher education perspective, sometimes it can have a number of missions. So one is around research and developing the culture of a society. And that may be sometimes at odds with the mission that is involved with educating um, the society. And generally, the education part is actually only a small minor part of a higher education organization's mission, where education is really part of the process of changing the nature of society and supporting the research aspect. And the research then informs the education. Of course, research can't change society on its own. It needs a framework of education in order to make changes to that society. So a lot of people, a lot of students see higher education as being primarily about teaching. Um, but those in higher education know that that is only a very small component of the mission of higher education. But any organization will have a basic philosophy and some core values. So it might be about having every student have an opportunity to be successful. Or it may be about identifying the, those with the most potential and supporting those students to be successful, um, depending upon the culture and the nature of an organization. Hopefully there'll be some goals established as to how or what should be achieved and some basic strategies for achieving those goals. Now, many organizations also have some performance criteria about what's expected. So it might be um, how many hours of instruction to provide to students each year or particular goals in terms of how many students will get A's in a class or whether or not we'll achieve against national benchmarks and be at least at the average of the of the national benchmarks and hopefully above the average things like that there'll be various decision making rules we talked about this in the policy section so there'll be certain processes we go through around making decisions so it may be that the principal makes all the decisions or the heads of departments and they may get together and make decisions or it may be that all teachers and all employees are part of that it may be we include students in that decision making process we might even also include parents through parent and citizen groups and stuff like that to have a role in decision making in the organization. And then there'll be certain ethical standards that are required in an organization. And in particular years, in more, most recent years in many countries, that issue is also included um, in, in proprietary and things that members in the organization shouldn't be doing um, and consequences of things of that nature. So there are some of the things that a vision statement should include. Does anyone have any others or comments I'd like to make around that? Whoops. So we've just gone through things fairly quickly there in terms of that first document and then into the second one. Hopefully you've had a read of them and you've got some statements you'd like to make or comments or questions.
So Adrian mentions, the first document reminded me of another technique called co-design. Okay, yep. Um, and really it is a design process. Um, and there is some new approaches to this process called design thinking and using design thinking as a framework for policy development and um, visioning and all those other aspects. That's fairly new. Um, but yes, it is a designing process and we can think of it in that way. Certainly the iterative nature of these processes are coming from the design cycle aspect. Um, we don't tend to do as much testing and evaluation of, of our planning processes and visioning statements. They tend to be a little bit too esoteric for us to actually nut down and do any testing of them in any real way. Uh, we tend to just establish them and then use them for a few years and see if they've worked well for the organization. If, and if not, we then revise them and make changes to them. But yes, yeah, certainly there can be aspects of the design process that um, is involved and the co-design process where we're doing it in a collaborative way is um, part of that. And certainly is, an advoca is advocated that uh, visioning and policy development and so forth should be a consultative uh, process. Any other statements, comments, etc.? Okay, let's jump back in then. So we have certain benefits of establishing a vision statement. Um, everyone can see how they fit within an organization. Um, the idea that conception precedes perception. So we really need to conceptualize what we want to achieve before we can really see what we want to achieve. So until it's articulated and described and detailed, people can't really understand what it is we're trying to achieve in terms of being able to perceive it. But once we can define it, then people can get on board with achieving what we want to um, do in an organization um, as a result of having gone through that process. Getting agreement on a vision gives more power towards achieving it. If it's simply a statement by the leadership or even just a statement imposed externally, it's very difficult for everyone to get a book aboard and power that through towards some sort of achievement of that, excuse me, of that vision statement. And likewise, the more specific and reasonable it is, the more likely it is to be achieved. If we have a vision statement saying every child will, um, will, will get a Nobel, Nobel Prize in, in physics by the end of their course, that's probably not achievable. Um, and there's lots of vision statements that do fall into that trap of being too aspirational. Now, we have to be a little bit aspirational because we want to move things forward, but setting our goals well beyond what can be achieved um, can be problematic. So we have to be realistic in what can be achieved. And that's why we often set time frames for our vision statements. So this is our vision statement for the next five years or the next 10 years. What we want to see occur in our organization over that time frame. Um, they can reduce conflict within an organization. If everyone has, has agreed on a goal, then when conflict does occur, we can say, well, we want to achieve this goal. This is how we think we should be achieving the goal um, and argue your case and they can argue their case and we can sort of make, have a framework on which to discuss um, potential conflicts. If everyone is unsure about what the goal is, then it's difficult to resolve such conflicts where you can say you want to achieve it this way, but they can say, well, I want to achieve this this way. And because you're trying to achieve different things, there's no common ground on which to have a real rational um, discussion about um, what should happen to move things forward. And it can also help an organization understand where they fit within 
the society that they're working within, and particularly as things might be changing rapidly. So higher education, for example, was in a bit of a panic in recent years because of the innovation of MOOCs. And the whole idea that the, the role and nature of higher education teaching might be changing because we're going to open up these massive online courses for everyone all around the world to participate in. And how is that going to change how universities have um, been the repositories and development of the society's um, knowledge and so forth? And there was quite a bit of concern about that. So because universities and that have vision statements and they could see that their role was much greater than just a teaching role, and the potential impact from MOOCs, they could understand that, yes, that was important and we needed to consider those sort of things, but they weren't gonna necessarily change the actual vision of the organization and the overall purpose of the universities and so forth. And so they could fit within um, the framework of teaching at a university and we could see how MOOCs could be used to support various things, but they weren't going to completely overturn and change the nature of university education because university education fitted within a whole larger framework and vision process that was beyond just the impact upon that one particular challenge. Okay, then we come to the nuts of establishing a vision. So going through various processes to develop a vision and the previous document outlined one particular approach using that card system of getting stakeholders together and coming up with different issues and working those into a vision statement. But there are a few things that vision statements should include. Uh, the desired outcome and benefits. So where you wanna see things going and what will be the benefit of achieving that. Ideally, they should grow out of previous vision statements and Ideally, um, where those things have been achieved, and then you're looking for doing things beyond those achievements. But also, if those haven't been achieved, then maybe reconsidering them and either coming up with a different way of achieving them or changing them as not possibly not achievable for the organization. They should still be inspirational and drive things forward and not just be about uh, maintaining the status quo, or worse, um, retreating into some a more closed sort of approach to doing things. And they should be widely disseminated to all the stakeholders in an organization, so all the people involved in the organization, but also external stakeholders, so that everyone knows what the organization is about, what's trying to be achieved, and they can then frame their interactions with the organization with that knowledge. And it can be created at any point. And so in our case, we're going to be creating it at the start of an implementation plan process. But it can also be developed um, for strategy level and at other stages that we're not really discussing in this particular course. Then we have a process for developing it. This is one used at a particular university using some worksheets of key questions. Um, smaller groups then go through and look at those um, questions and develop their own individual vision statements. So essentially you get a whole lot of vision statements. Then they're combined and we work out all the key um, issues from each of the individual vision statements. And there can often be a process like we did for the Delphi process of voting and coming up with a consensus of what the vision should be. In this case, though, they go through a process of creating um, scenarios for their organization, like what you've just done for your assignment, about where the organization should be in 20 years' time, and describing that and using that to help frame a vision statement for an organization. And then just a couple of references there to assist you. So there's lots of ways of going about creating visions. Um, there's no one correct way. There's no one appropriate way that you have to follow. There's just various strategies and ideas to throw around. 
In our case, for your assignment, you're going to be doing it as just a precursor for your implementation plan. And it really just sets the overall direction of what you want to achieve in your implementation plan by framing it as a vision statement. We could have just framed it as a set of aims and objectives and things like that, but it's sometimes more useful to frame it as a vision statement rather than a more prosaic set of aims and objectives. Um, so any questions on that document before we go and have a look at the second assignment? All good, indeed. And I reiterate the whole point of these discussions is for you to actually discuss and ask questions and uh, read the documents and develop a series of questions that you'd like to ask during the sessions. Um, my summary of them is an approach that we can use, but it, I've found that it's not as effective as if you come along with a whole series of questions that we can unpack and discuss and argue um, about the issues raised in the documents. And please feel free to argue against any of the issues raised. Um, I'm not at all precious about these. These aren't things I've written. Um, they're just frameworks that are available to help us understand different ways of doing things. And there can certainly be many other ways of doing things that aren't described in this document or even opposed to the way that they're described in these particular documents. Oops. Could we consider some compass? Oops, one sec. Could we consider some opposition to the organization's vision statement? Yes, you can, and we'll be discussing that in our consideration of stakeholders. Um, because when you consider your stakeholders, you'll need to think about what their level of support for various aspects of what you want to achieve. And sometimes there, there will be stakeholders which will be opposed and you'll need to come up with strategies to get those stakeholders on board with what you want to have happen. So in terms of considering them in opposition to your vision statement, it's much more about how to either make it so that they can't affect what you want to have done or ideally change their perspective so that they will support what you want to do. So this is assignment two, your implementation plan. And you'll see there that the very first step is to develop an educational vision statement for your selected organization with consideration of pedagogy, curriculum, content, and technology. So think back to the TPAC model um, about the, the three main aspects. So in terms of your vision statement, you should at least consider the three main things that are core to education, which is the pedagogy, the approaches that you're going to be using for teaching, what you're actually teaching in terms of curriculum and content, and the various technologies, because that is the focus of this course. Um, so there are three things you have to include as part of your vision statement, but then you can include any other aspects that you wish to. From that, you're going to then identify the various stakeholders that are interested in what you achieve in your organization. So it may be the government, maybe business and employers, maybe parents, the students, educators, support staff, administrators, etc., etc. Um, and you need to work out what they expect and then whether or not they're going to be supportive or opposed or neutral. And later on, there'll be an opportunity to, in step uh, seven, to put forward strategies for getting those stakeholders to support what you want to have done, or at the very least to be neutral to what you want to do. So that's the basics of where we're starting into assignment two. 
then you'll do a socio socio eco ecosystem analysis uh, very much like your systems thinking uh, your systems model but I'll be giving you a slightly different framework to explore that next week I think it is um, then you'll identify the differences between your vision and what you've ex um, identified as part of your socio um, your systems model your socio ecosystem model um, the importance of this is if you're already achieving everything in your vision statement then there's no real need to change so part of the process will be to explore what what is occurring in your organization from various perspectives and from that compare it against what you want to achieve in your vision statement and identify then in step four the differences um, because they'll be important aspects that you, that you need to then address in your implementation plan which is then step five um, you'll have identified then the changes required particularly as they relate to pedagogy uh, curriculum and content and technology and then you're going to develop three um, scenarios or in this case not, not quite scenarios they what you would prefer to see your organization at in one year's time five years time and ten years time and then as I mentioned step seven how to get your stakeholders on board with achieving those outcomes and then you're going to come up with a set of actions to achieve those changes and a plan that has a whole series of steps that we're going to be discussing uh, over the next few weeks to achieve that and that frames your second assignment there's some suggested word limits so around about 250 words for your educational vision which is what you're we've been discussing tonight so you can get started on developing a vision statement for your own organization um, as a result of what we've been talking about and start your second assignment in that respect questions comments statements etc etc so next week we're going to be looking at uh, traditional school environments or educational environments and how they've developed in week 11 we're going to be looking at how different organizations have developed um, emerging models and ways of doing things differently and the final week in week 12 we'll look at how organizations have transformed um, their processes so how they've achieved their particular vision statements Does it have to link back to, I presume that's assignment one, um, is it ATT? Yes, okay. Uh, no, it doesn't, but I would suggest that you've already done a fair bit of work in assignment one, and you can build upon that for assignment two. You don't have to. You can sort of develop your own, a different system, um, and understand that and develop that into your assignment two. But because you've done a lot of systems thinking around that as part of assignment one, um, I've designed these assignments to build upon one another um, and can certainly do so. But if you really wish to do something different, you're welcome to do so. And yes, it can be loosely connected. There's no, I'm not going to be going back and checking to see if you've um, exactly matched what was happening in assignment one to assignment two. You can change whatever you want as part of that, but it's there to assist you and to build upon if you wish. Okay, other comments or discussion for this evening? Otherwise we'll be finishing a bit early. Which may not be a bad thing. You can get, you can get started on your assignment. Do we have to explain the TPAC framework or just apply it? 
Ah, that's a good question. Um, uh, no, because it's written for myself and you know that I know what the TPAC framework is, you can certainly just refer to it as TPAC. Um, remember though, if you want to use this in your own organizations, then you should identify it and explain it. But for an assignment purposes, you don't necessarily have to, uh, because I've already taught you that, so you know that myself as the audience um, knows the model. We'll probably, this <laughs> one's sick. We'll probably go over the word limit if you're going to explain the framework. Oh, remember though, you can just reference it. So reference Wikipedia where it explains it. Um, so you don't need to go into detail. Um, the whole idea of referencing means you don't have to um, repeat lots of sections from other works. And the TPAC model shouldn't form a major section of the assignment. It's just there as a framework for you to um, cover a range of issues rather than get focused on one particular aspect, such as curriculum or teaching or technology. Any other aspects? So hopefully now you should be starting to read the second assignment and be starting to think about what you're going to do. Um, I've been explaining it all we've gone through, all the time we've gone through, so you should have a reasonable idea. For those watching along with these videos, um, if you've got questions about that, you can post them to the course Facebook group and we can discuss those aspects there. Um, or you can always come along and join us in these online discussions and discuss your questions and provide your comments and backwards and forwards with discussions in that respect. I do understand though that some of you like to work just independently and not be involved um, in that way. And so you're still welcome to do so, but I always encourage you to come along and participate if you would like to. Otherwise, poor Henry, Adrian, and Hadis, and Connie have to do all the talking. <laughs> or typing, yes. Okay, then. Well... I've run out of content for this evening. Um, I should have given you more readings. <laughs> no, but seriously, please do the readings so that we can have an in-depth conversation about the issues. Um, I do understand you want me to explain and unpack things, and I'm more than happy to do so, but it does help if we do it in a framework where it can be done as Q&A rather than just lecturing. Um, in the main, all the theory tells us that you get a much better educational outcome through dialogue about the issues rather than me just talking to you about them. So I really would encourage you to do those pre-readings and come up with a series of questions to ask and discuss during these sessions so that we can have some in-depth discussion about them. And remember, I'm more than happy if you want to develop opposing perspectives. That can provide some really nice, vibrant discussion about issues, and we can unpack things in more depth if you do that process. I won't be marking you down at all if you disagree with what I'm saying or put forward op oppo opposing ideas and things of that nature. In fact, that should be encouraged at a master's level. Okay, does anyone have anything else they would like to discuss? Somewhat related to this course, hopefully. No, I think that we're still absorbing, like, we just went through the second assignment. So it's like, or what right now what is going through my mind is how am I going to do this? Where am I going to draw the information from? Because we have to come with basically defining this plan. So, well, we are, some of us already picked the model. So it's like, we just mentioned it. And but then you have to start, we're, I think we're planning. And this is 
do on the by the end of week 11 which is mm -hmm. basically three weeks um yes it's fairly soon coming along so so it's like we have a very short time period to start working on this and yeah most of us hadn't started because we just finished with the assignment one so we uh, didn't see what was coming so it's like we're trying to no, Adrian, unfortunately, we can't extend the submissions. Um, they're actually due very, I have to have your results done very soon after the end of the course, because tri-semester three starts only a couple of weeks. Well, I think it's one week after we finish. Um, so yeah, I'd love to be able to extend it, but unfortunately, it all has to be done. I've given you basically the latest possible dates for when it can be submitted. Um, and extensions can only be a maximum of one week then, and that makes basically I have no marking time uh, to mark them if if they uh, if they need to be extended in that respect. So I would love to give you more time for them, but unfortunately that just doesn't exist. Um, yeah, the university processes are still being worked out, and our tri semesters, because we've now condensed things quite a lot, um, mean we don't have much of a gap between semesters in order to have that flexibility to extend things and um, give more time to, to what we could have done in the past. Um, so yes, you will have to get started and get to work on it. Generally, those students find this one nowhere near as complicated or difficult as the first assignment. The first assignment introduced a whole lot of new concepts and ways of doing and thinking about things. And we're now really just extending upon those again for your second assignment. And we've been talking about this sort of process all the way through. So it's now just about putting your ideas that hopefully you've established in your first assignment into a process that can be implemented in an organization. And we'll be discussing the different strategies to assist you in achieving that um, and framing your organizational plan for that, or implementation plan, I should say. So it's conceptually, it's, it's an easier assignment than the first one. Um, but there's a lot of new, a lot of individual points that you have to address. They all flow from one another and they have a process which I've just described. So if you work through things in a natural way, it should develop into a document that makes sense for you. But that said, you do only have three weeks for it. Um, so you will need to get started and keep up on it because uh, it does still need to be of a high quality for the high marks that I would love to be able to give you. So what what is the exact date this assignment is to? On the, Let was... me have a look. Um, the, eighth, the 8th of October. The 8th of October. OK, so it gives us one, two, three, almost four weeks. Yep. OK, the 8th of October. Yeah, we need to start working on that, like, now. But that's the thing. Get started. Um, as I've said, I've framed what you could do for the vision statement this evening. So you could start writing that um, and get that out of the way. And then you could probably even start in a few of the other sections, but we'll be building upon those each week as we go uh, towards the end of the course. Okay, so regarding literature, like, do we have a limit of how many documents we can reference, or no. there's a minimum or top? Of, because in this case, it's a plan, so basically we are coming with something that is kind of original. Correct. You know, like, so we may draw examples like successful, you know, case yes. studies and like that, but. And particularly in terms of the technologies that you're incorporating, you can certainly reference those. Um, and uh, have that to support your arguments. Um, you may, as we discussed at the beginning, have some policy documents you want to refer to, but don't get too caught up with policy frameworks and documents. So as you said, or as I've sort of explored in this, the vision statement that you're being asked to prepare isn't that complicated. Certainly there are much more complicated vision statements that are possible, but really you want to just make sure you address those three dimensions, uh, pedagogy, content, and technology in your vision statement. And then you can have any other aspects that you have as important for your organization to frame your vision. 
But the things I need to see are those three aspects. And then you can set your goals and other as and aspirational aspects of the um, your plan in terms of your vision. Okay. In terms of minimum, Adrian, there's no real minimum required. Um, but most assignments have about 10. But there's no... Yeah, don't go scrambling around to find one if you've only got nine or seven or something like that. Um, yeah, your references are there to support your documentation. You're not required to do so. That won't be one of the criteria. Um, I better just check that, how I've said that. <laughs> but I can't, don't recall it being a part of the requ required criteria. No. Okay, so no, no more questions. No, in my case, I don't have any more questions. Does anyone else have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll finish up. But I'd encourage you to get started and just fleshing it out. Um, even do a sort of a rough, some rough drafts of your implementation plan. And then we can discuss those over the coming weeks. And I'm glad you're excited, Adrian. He is very excited, I can tell. Okay, then. Well, we'll finish and, <laughs> and you can get started. Okay, then. Good night, all. Hey, good night.